Uh, good morning to all of you. In, 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 in academics, it's almost impossible to talk without slides. So <laughs> looking behind me with a pointer and there's nothing. So, therefore, I had to write a few comments. So let me first um, thank Jeremy and Allison, who I can for a few minutes, and the state, especially HHS, for organizing this and bringing this, this beautiful um, facility, and to all the people who joined us today. Uh, today is the 30th anniversary of World AIDS Day. It started 30 years ago by the World Health Organization um, in 1988 uh, to recognize the gravity of the HIV pandemic and to get every country to focus on this pandemic. And every country in the world is a signatory to World AIDS Day. So every country celebrates this. This is one of eight global holidays. Today's World AIDS Day theme is Know Your Status. Uh, every year there's a theme, and I think that's going to be an important topic of conversation as we go through the day, the Know Your Status idea. So then the question is, why, does, why is there a global holiday or global recognition of uh, uh, HIV? And it's because of the gravity of the problem. There are 40 million people who died, roughly 40 million people have died from this infection, and, and 40 million people are living with this infection. Um, and then the question is, how? Living with HIV, that could not have been imagined in this state in 1980 when HIV first surfaced. So how is it possible that what was a universally fatal disease is now really entirely treatable? This brings me to comments about North Carolina, and since we're really here on behalf of the state and our community relationships, let's focus on North Carolina. Uh, North Carolina became an HIV and AIDS work in the very beginning of, the, of this pandemic. And the reason why it may not be obvious to everyone here is because we had thousands of people in North Carolina living with hemophilia. So people with hemophilia moved here because of the medical care they could receive in the state. And very quickly, people with hemophilia became infected and were a harbinger of the pandemic. And so it was necessary um, to get involved. And then what happened kind of remarkably that across the state, communities and clinicians and university academics and scientists and industry in this state really all got together very quickly and volunteered to participate in helping these very, very sick people. Um, and that was regardless of the fear and stigma that was associated with this disease. New infectious diseases are terrifying. And um, I cannot emphasize enough how when the people who in these communities volunteered, they were, they were truly courageous. And then the people living with HIV were, at that time were, ter and, and still, but at that time in particular, terribly stigmatized. And, and one cannot forget that era as we look a little bit backwards. Um, of course, there was no treatment at that time, and by 1985, about 20% of the people admitted to UNC Hospital were admitted for AIDS, which was a universally fatal disease. And so that was going on then. The world changed in 1988 when Burroughs Welcome, our local company, which has morphed into Glaxo and now morphed into Vive, a local company developed and uh, reported a drug called AZT. And that was the first drug to treat HIV, and that was like a landmark and unbelievably different for all of us trying to deal with this problem because um, this was a universally fatal disease and suddenly people were getting better and gaining weight. And it was just earth shaking. So from the beginning, the people of North Carolina have played a major role in optimizing treatment and prevention and now the cure of HIV. And the people of this state um, have made really too many contributions to kind of summarize all at once. But let me just mention big successes that have gone on here. The development of triple drug therapy, the people in the state were critical um, in participating in the development of that uh, activity. Vaccine development, people in North Carolina have worked on vaccines tirelessly. Um, and then in the state of North Carolina, the state as the leader um, played a huge role in strategies for better detection of HIV. North Carolina was the first state um, to work on the detection of acute infection, and that was at the injections of the CDC, and now everyone focuses on early and acute infection. And North Carolina has been the first state to use molecular epidemiology very aggressively um, in order to try and better um, understand where we're going. And again, now everyone is doing this. So uh, I think we can be truly proud of the policies and innovations of this state. At the center of all this, of course, are courageous people living with this infection. Um, day to day, the community groups, many of whom are recognized here, who help with every aspect of managing strategically the, the, the situation we're in. And then the enlightened and tireless leadership from the state. Uh, and again, everyone is represented here today. At the risk of causing tremendous embarrassment, but I'm going to do it, I need to talk about Evelyn Faust. <laughs> so, you know, the AIDS pandemic has required stewardship for 30 years through three decades of government. There are 75 governors in North Carolina, as you know, and I think all were represented during this epidemic. 
all seven, that's not really true. There were seven governors, <laughs> there were seven different administrations that during this um, uh, pandemic that have had to, you know, have policies and strategies and personnel that all work on the problem. But throughout all this, throughout all these different administrations, Evelyn Faust has been the glue, and she's really the super glue. And that's the best way of looking at that. She's the super glue that's held, I think, everything together and always moving forward. It's never a day where it's not like, she never takes the same ground twice, those of you who are with her. Forward, forward, forward. So I just really want to recognize Evelyn. <laughs> I, I really, I go frequently to the state and territorial HIV meetings, and Evelyn is a force of nature that is well recognized around the United States and probably doesn't get enough recognition. Today's a good day to focus on that. Okay, enough about the past. Where do we go from here? Where, what's next? HIV is a chronic disease. With early and proper treatment, people with HIV live, should live, will live a, a totally normal life and a totally normal lifespan. In fact, some studies suggest you live longer with HIV than if you are, are not HIV infected. So what a difference 30 years makes. This would be unimaginable when all this started. The day is organized for us to recognize and most importantly solve challenges, challenges um, in the detection and treatment and cure of HIV infection here in North Carolina and to promote collaborations among the people who are with us here today. So that's what we're gonna do today. Of course, um, my own work over many years and, and uh, a commitment to the state is for the prevention of HIV. So for prevention, we don't have a vaccine, but even without a vaccine, the world has changed dramatically. And very soon the CDC, very soon, will announce a new campaign, not yet named, that's, but the basic idea of a new campaign is getting to zero, that there should be zero new cases of HIV. Uh, I firmly believe that North Carolina can and should be the first state to achieve this goal. This should be our aspiration, and, and I don't see it as impossible. So let's use this day to decide, at least in part, how North Carolina is going to get to zero. Two things are already decided in my mind. First, it cannot hurt to have excellent surveillance that tells us exactly the trajectory where we're at. It can't hurt for us, for everyone, to know their status, the campaign of World AIDS Day. And second, it cannot hurt to find and treat every person with HIV infection to revert to a normal lifespan. And at the same time have the benefit of treatment as prevention, the global strategy that's now in place for the prevention of HIV. Of course, that's not enough. We're gonna hear a lot more of a lot of other ideas. So let me end, because Jeremy, hold up one finger now, or half a finger, okay? Uh, let me end these very brief remarks by saying, I know I'm gonna hear a lot of great new ideas over the course of the day that, that's been organized, of how to deal with our challenges. Uh, I have only one request about the ideas, and it's let's go faster. This is like the kind of Evelyn idea. It's enough to have an idea, but if we just put the idea in a, in a drop box or in a parking lot, that's not the same as moving forward, moving faster. So let me end again uh, by thanking the organizers who you're going to hear from and the state for bringing us all together, and I look forward to the program today. Thank you. Um, so I see a similarity between Caribbean culture um, in the Caribbean and, and rural culture in the United States. <coughs> Uh, and that is that, uh, depending on where you live, you're very isolated. Mm -hmm. So with HIV in the Caribbean and, and uh, in my um, dealings with rural Georgia and rural North Carolina, um, if you're a sufferer or if you're a um, person with HIV in rural area, everyone knows. And so the first thing is stigma. And I think it's a little bit different from the stigma uh, that everyone talks about, I mean, in terms of, you know, someone knowing you have HIV and a stigma that goes along with that. In rural areas in the Caribbean, the stigma uh, goes beyond the individual, but the family. Uh, and many people, many uh, people with HIV will not test, or if they suspect they have HIV, will not test and will not disclose because of the um, tremendous amount of pressure from the family they're afraid, of, they're afraid of the shame and the stigma that goes along with that. Um, and it's unfortunate because many people uh, live with the disease and, and suffer. And those that um, do um, reveal their status in the rural areas um, suffer tremendously. I have, um, in the Caribbean, seen, uh, observed situations where people, I'm talking about um, health practitioners, 
were so unaware or so miseducated about HIV, they would not even come um, uh, close to that person. I remember uh, I have a, a brother-in-law who died of HIV, um, and they put medication, they administered the medication on the stick mm -hmm. to give to that person. They would not, uh, if this person sneezed, they would walk away, so they were so afraid. And the stigma um, even transcends that in that family members would do anything. They would even pay the coroner to change the death certificate. They would put any or anything else other than HIV. And that's a tremendous stigma. And so when, when people, particularly in the Caribbean rural area, uh, know that the stigma is not just with them, but the family, and they're, they're um, receiving a tremendous amount of pressure from the family not to disclose. You can see how uh, that complicates uh, treatment. And again, in, in rural area, uh, as opposed to urban, urban area, everyone knows. You can't hide it because uh, we're dealing with, um, I mean, I've traveled the world now, uh, not just in rural area, but globally. And it's usually one um, health agency that's available to treat or to, to provide care for HIV. So you can walk in an agency or you walk in a health facility and people know that. And the same thing is true in the, in the Caribbean and in the rural areas. Um, very little resources. Um, the other thing that I noticed too in the rural area, we're dealing with low population density. And I've heard um, providers refuse to give or refuse to go in um, low density area because they're saying it's just not worth we're talking about doctors, we're talking about skilled professionals. And the uh, uh, complaint is that <coughs> it's not worth my time or my effort to go in a, in a rural area with only ten people with HIV. And we're talking about so that's <coughs> a, a, a big challenge. Um, in terms of low resource area. And we're talking about people with multiple, multiple needs. So it's not just you may be diagnosed with HIV, with substance abuse, mm -hmm. uh, mental illness, mm -hmm. and other um, medical conditions. You need not only comprehensive skills here, but specialized care. Um, and to get medical health professionals with the, the kind of skill that are needed to treat people in rural areas. Uh, especially in low density uh, population here, it's just a challenge and um, many people suffer um, and live with disease uh, and not get treatment because of this um, social isolation and because of lack of resources in these areas. Well, I'd like to piggyback on what Dr. Williams said about stigma and I'm going to just give you a little bit of my information real quickly. Um, I um, have been in North Carolina for now 13 years. But I came from New York City and started a lot of my social, 25 years of social work experience in direct practice um, and in the beginning of the 80s in the crack, crack epidemic. And so we saw a lot of programs um, just beginning because I have lived without, you know, maybe HIV and HIV because again, I was uh, starting out my career. Um, but I was a director for one of the first programs, which was Steinway Child and Family Services Case Management Programs. And we had a Ryan White, beginning services, Ryan White status like housing program, where we basically uh, did something around wraparound services for our families and fam you know, consumers who were um, struggling with the, the disease. And so that was the beginning of my experience. And then I moved over to Community Healthcare Network, which was another um, medical facility, non-for-profit, where I was a director for um, Jamaica Queens Community Healthcare Network. And so in that particular facility, I was a center director, and we had HIV holistic services. So I had providers that not only work with my um, population of, of patients, but we also had um, acupuncture. And so that was kind of, so we went from a medical model, but then also from a holistic model. So bringing that forth from now, I'm in Durham. I've been here for uh, 13 years, have been on the mental health board, the Alliance board when it changed over, and I'm so proud to be on the DSS board. So also I'm a servant leader, not only just in social work, but um, just really trying to make sure that we have continu continuum of care for, for um, people living with all kinds of diseases and things like that. But talking about rural areas and how people living with HIV in rural areas and some of the challenges, and again, stigma, 
Um, some of the other things is just resources. Some of the other things is transport, just little as transportation. Transportation to get to whatever facilities are in those areas. Um, consumers feeling like there is going to be some discrimination and stigma. Because when we, you know, I come from the big New York City, but I know in North Carolina I'm learning that everyone knows Durham, everybody knows one another. I came in and saw, you know, a couple of different people, um, you know, that I work with and have seen and have been just going, uh, working with the new sheriff or left that's going to be taking office. I was on his campaign and so I've been seeing people that I've worked with. So it's small, right? And so we, we're not a rural situation in Durham, but in rural areas, patients feel like if I go to that little clinic, you know, someone's going to know me. Someone's aunt, someone's sister, even the receptionist might go back and tell somebody. Um, you know, and that brings up confidential, confidentiality and concern. It brings up also the issue of affordable insurance. You know, one of the things as an educator of social work, I try to educate my students around how you're going to work with different populations. And so I talk about when I teach my students and, and, and Kim knows, uh, uh, we talk, she, she has me for human behavior. So we look at, at things at, from a a person in environment. So let's just talk about person in environment. So you have people living with HIV AIDS in rural areas. And so we need to look at what their environment is. The environment is lack of resources, the environment, and also teach about Maslow hierarchy of need. So if you have people in certain areas that don't have basic shelter and food, they're not gonna be able to go and get basic resources for, for medicine. So this, it's very important. Um, and I'm always into looking at, especially being on the different boards that I've been on and now on the DSS board, um, looking at different innovative ways because what we have to do is get back to the micro level. And that's actually asking our patients, what do they need? You know, we can do a lot of research and I do research too, but what, looking at that micro level, what do they need? And sometimes they just say, again, me being in the community and people coming up to me, you know, I need transportation. I need to be able to feel like I can go to a place where it's confidential. I need to be able to feel like I can go to a place where they make me feel like a person, a whole person, that you're looking at me from a holistic view. Again, looking at my basic needs. Um, you know, again, and whatever programs can we put in place. I'm a big advocate of case management. I started one of the first case management programs in the 80s, in the beginning of that whole crack epidemic with one of our first African-American mayors, David Dinkins. And what he talked about was, you know, you've got people over here getting services for medical services, you've got people over here getting services for social, but no one's talking. So no one's coming to the table and having a conversation. And now, and again, we're not bringing the patient or the client to the table, and that's very important. So stigma, lack of resources, and just like creative things. If someone's saying, I have, a, I have an issue with transportation, well, what about a mobile crisis van? Okay, and that's one of the things we also did. And I hate to be compared it to New York because New York is so big, but I'm always into this innovative way of how can we do things, right? And so if someone, if I have clients coming in saying a patient that I can't get to my services, so I can't get a mobile crisis van, or a van where you have a continuum of care, you have a caseworker, psychiatrist, you know, um, case managers in that particular van going out door to door to those people in the rural areas. Because first of all, that kind of eliminates what? The stigma. Right? And then when I teach my students, it's kind of starting where the patient is, <coughs> starting where the client is. Mm -hmm. So. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> Just to reiterate uh, yeah. some of the things that have been said already, uh, insurance, a lot of the people in the rural area do not have insurance. So therefore, they will be skeptical about going to see a doctor. Transportation, and again, we got to think about the culture in that area. Um, and um, education, mm -hmm. that's a big factor. They have not been educated. It's why it's so important that along with testing and everything that you bring about the education component of it also. Thank you, thank you so much. And now being that I'm from rural North Carolina, um, my late husband, he passed away six and a half years ago um, to the illness, complications to AIDS. And one thing that I noticed with his family, being that we're all from the rural area and they're from Nash County, is that the stigma was so high, like we talked about, and the resources were low. And once I actually was moving and found his journals, I got to read about how much the stigma really impacted his life, how talking with faith leaders really convinced him that medication was not the treatment, that he lived actually untreated eight and a half years before passing. And those were choices he made at a young age of 23 years old of diagnosis. Going into Wake Human Services, having the type of disease intervention specialist that was following up to some extent, 
but the social notes reflect that that engagement was there where he was feeling stigmatized a little. So I think that's why it's so important that each of us are in the room to look at not only how the patient feels and how they're being spoken to, but also about how we're directing ourselves to our patients and how we're treating them as well. So I'm so glad we talked about that because in rural North Carolina, it is a different type of stigma. Um, here, it's a little bit more esteemed. We have more colleges, universities, research. We have a lot more resources. But when I do go home, I still can be in the local grocery store, the IGA, for those familiar with rural areas. <laughs> I can be in the local IGA and somebody come to me, didn't your husband die of a spider bite? Or didn't he pass away of AIDS? Didn't he have AIDS? And it's like right there in the middle of the aisle seven. And I'm just like, hello, how are you? Thank you for asking how I'm doing. You know, but I have to remember that just sometimes the culture of the different areas, um, that's why I've been working with Mr. Nancy, who's been an amazing person, and I plan on doing a lot more advocacy work. So thank you, panel, for that. Our second question is, if you have the opportunity to address those challenges we just talked about in your community with unlimited resources, what would that look like? Now, I know Mr. Nancy's got some words for us for that. How would you go about achieving that strategy? I know you're right on the front line. If you had unlimited resources, and there are resources in this room. <laughs> that are listening. That are listening. I, I think it's bringing everybody to the table. Yes. Like, this, like, like more forms like this, mm -hmm. what I'm about you having forms, but let's get it done. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, it could, we can talk and communicate, but like, what are we actually putting into practice? Mm -hmm. And again, I'm coming from that case management model where we're getting everybody at the table and coming up and having our clients and our patients mm -hmm. at the table and coming up with things mm -hmm. that are really going to make a, a difference for them. So mm -hmm. wrapping around services for them, mm -hmm. you know, making sure that, again, whatever we put in place is going to be something that is a goal that they can achieve. You know, we can't say, okay, we need you to go to these services and then 10,000 miles away. <laughs> you know, that's, that's just not realistic. Um, so I really am really big in, we've got so many um, resources in this room, but a lot of times we don't talk to one another. And so your agency might be able to do one thing, you might be able to do the, the, the mental health piece of it, somebody else may be able to do the medical model of it, and we need to bring it together. And so we need to have that continuum of care and actually have, and I, I kind of always go from this case management model, because again, that's what my start was, at the beginning of starting programs, and my program in New York was funded by the State Office and City Office of Mental Health, and it worked. We definitely need to keep money, we definitely need to keep money in the prevention program. Mm -hmm. In the Wilson, and Wilson County area, 10 years ago, we were in the top five with the virus. Along with the combined effort of Carolina Family Health, OIC, Wilson County Health Department, and other people in the other people in the community helping, joining together, joining the forces, and prevention. Because we found out that you know, Ashley, the Pat Oxidine, the Don Capellini, they found out and they fought for prevention a long time ago. Now that we're combined with care and prevention, we have to be awful careful that care doesn't take all the money. I on your care, but it's nice because OIC has been working with, with these organizations all along. So it wasn't hard for us to make that, that transition with care and prevention because we were already doing it. We were already trying to think of ways, how are we going to combat this? This is a huge monster out here, and we have to find ways. Wilson County HIV and AIDS Task Force. Uh, I mean, all these things, combined effort that I work with, uh, even now that um, the needle exchange program, we implemented that. So we can get closer to the people that really use these things. And we get a chance to test them, to build a relationship with them. And other than that, we can be able to touch them because they wouldn't come our way. So just keeping money in prevention. <laughs> Wonderful. So thank you again for those answers. And I agree. I think a lot of challenges, of course, we know funding. Funding is always a big one. And we also know sometimes access. Um, getting those conversations in the room with Department of Transportation, looking at public transportation options. I know in Wilson we're very limited with public transportation options, even though here in Raleigh-Durham area we have a lot more options when it comes to hours the bus lines are going, where they're going to how people can have access to health facilities, on bus routes. So those are things where I think definitely engaging that conversation and like they were saying earlier today about making what we talk about today moving forward. I love that Dr. Cohen talked about that. Moving forward and what will go after this today. So thank you.
Oh, go ahead, sure, Doctor. Yeah. Uh, so um, my uh, my uh, input to that is that 20 years ago, I was made director of an aid service organization. I think we're the largest aid service organization in the country, and you know, at, at very impressive credentials, and I thought I knew everything about everything. Uh, I supervise uh, case managers in 26 different agencies and five shared departments. And prepared this elaborate PowerPoint now. I'm going to tell all these hundreds of people who come to see me about what it is that they should do. And I was quickly humbled in terms of how much I don't know. So I tore up the PowerPoint and said, I'm going to listen. And so if I had unlimited resources, I would get, and I know it was a time of year, I would get everyone together at the table, all the stakeholders, and listen in terms of apportioning this unlimited funding uh, in terms of what to do with it. That's what I would do. Awesome. I'm glad we're here today to talk about it. And I just want to also add you know, education and also looking at um, cultural things too, mm -hmm. because yes. it looks different. You know, when I look at it from a um, biopsychosocial approach or a social cultural lens, it's, it looks different in terms of culture and how people, because I'm not gonna speak for the whole African-American culture, but from my experience in my own family, it's taboo, we're not gonna talk about it. Or I'm gonna go to the pastor and they're gonna lay hands on me and it's gonna be okay, and I don't have to go get any services. And so we have to continue to also start where the clients are, the patients are, and kind of also look at what, you know, culturally where they come from, you know, how their families, you know, um, I've had in the past um, when I was working um, with HIV and AIDS in New York, where sometimes in the beginning, now this is the 80s, where families didn't even want them in their homes. Yeah. So that's why we started the Ryan White uh, scattered, like, scattered Site Housing Program. And so it was, you know, imagine, you know, because we're not educated or because, and I'll just share one thing real quick, can I? One of my interns, my intern for my masters at Columbia was at Rosen Singer's um, Rikers Island. And I did have a patient that came to me, had open source, she was HIV, and she hugged me. And I was in, in the beginning of being, I was an intern, because I was at Columbia, I thought, I you know, like, I'm at Ivy League, yes, I got this, right? And so she hugged me and I jumped. And that was my level of not being educated because I automatically assumed that I was going to catch HIV and AIDS from just how hugging me. And I had to go back to that client as an intern and I had to, as I, after I spoke with my supervisor, um, we had a you know, supervision degree, friend, um, I had to go back and to really um, say sorry to her. But that was my level of not having the knowledge as a student, as an intern, even though I grew up in the South Bronx and, and was, you know, familiar with all of the different things, especially the drug epidemic of crack, you know, um, and heroin. And now that leads me to the opioid abuse here. You know, Wilmington has the highest amount of, of opioid abuse cases in all of North Carolina. And that's a rural area. So. Thank you. Thank you so much. Well, our other qu last question is, how do we integrate plans for economic expansion in eastern North Carolina with bottom-up approach that addresses health disparities? How do we move towards that? How do we integrate those plans? There's so many pieces. <laughs> right, there's so many pieces to that. Very, lots My of things. Right. <laughs> and, 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 and I don't know, you know, you know how the people say that I always take lead. But I would like to hear that that question from some of the people, the answer from some of the people in the audience, because you have the cutting edge approach to, um, because I'm always thinking about micro level approach starting from the bottom up and working our way up and really listening to uh, people who are affected by HIV. I don't know if anybody Okay. Well, we're going to open up to the panel and myself if you have questions for us. We definitely are taking open questions at this time for our audience. So, yes. So, you all talked about stigma. You all mentioned it first, I think, maybe because you were last. You didn't. <laughs> <laughs> so, I'm wondering with this question about all, having all the money in the world, mm -hmm. um, whether you have seen any specifics. Stigma, HIV-related stigma interventions that you think work for either community level stigma or internalized stigma and shame and so many people. Mm -hmm. But you think are effective, or that should be studied. Mm -hmm. that, that, that's just my area mm -hmm. of interest right now. So. You know, it's, I mean, there's always um, a, a way to do, you know, if you want something to be, uh, it's, it's how you disseminate that information. 
And I'll use the example from the, from the Caribbean in terms of uh, an intervention that reduces the, the, the stigma. So I think part of it starts with, with education, that people know what HIV is, know what it's not, know the way it is transmitted, know the way um, that it's not transmitted. And so I think that's um, uh, one of the, the important things uh, is education. Because unfortunately, it's the 21st century and HIV uh, AIDS have been with us 38 years, close to 40 years. And the assumptions are that um, people know that they're very knowledgeable about HIV. And so you can't, you can't reduce the stigma. You're not gonna get people to, um, to uh, be able to um, uh, overcome that stigma if they don't know about the disease. Uh, so I think, um, I, I think that's um, one of the ways. And one of the ways that we're able to do that in the Caribbean, and I think the same thing would apply in the rural areas, because in rural areas, we know that there's, a, there's a, um, not many health facilities. And, and if there are any available, that they're at a distance. But we know that your church, your religious organization, your public religious organization. And what we did was part of the church in terms of helping to reduce that stigma. I, I had a paper that was accepted at APH um, at the last conference. And the model was uh, the clergy as a community health worker. And partnered with, because the, the particularly the rural area and the Caribbean church have a tremendous amount of influence. Mm -hmm. And so that work, I'm not saying it's perfect, but it was a way that we could disseminate information and to at least get people to listen um, rather than the way you know, when you talk about it, people. Uh, we have known people since notion, a respected institution. Uh, like a church. And so the model is the church, the clergy, as a community worker, which has been very, very effective in terms of my limited use of that. I think also, again, I'm going to bring it back to education, and I, I will just ask the question, how many people in this room, when you go to a, a doctor or a medical provider, you know, you're looking for that bedside manner. And if I don't have that bedside manner, if I don't feel comfortable, I'm switching my provider. Um, <laughs> okay, okay. And so, uh, <laughs> and so, I really think that we have to do more education with not just from, uh, medical professionals. But I'm glad that I'm able to train a lot of the new social workers coming into the field um, around how do you treat someone. You know, um, I remember being a caseworker in the '80s, going into one of my first jobs was at child welfare, and going into someone's home, and I was looking, you know, I was with someone else, and he went in, and he's like, "Well, where's your food, and where's this, and where's that?" And I took a step back, and I said, "Okay, well, I'm not going to get beat up, you know, this is not going to work for me, you know." Um, and so I said, if I ever got to a point where I became a supervisor or I had my own cases, what I finally did, um, I was going to treat someone the way I wanted to be treated. Right. All right. And so that, again, starts with education, that starts with passion, that starts with just, you know, um, making someone feel comfortable so that I will want to open up to you and let you know, you know, I'm feeling this way, I might want to be tested, or I am HIV positive, and just really feeling um, comfortable about doing it. And I'm really, really, really big on making someone feel comfortable, and I teach my students that, because it goes a long way. And I'd just like to add, it's also important that that, uh, the, that we are educated, that we understand, that we know. And I uh, just like to thank Evelyn and Jacqueline so much for mm -hmm. the training that they do. And Cultural Sensitive by Nicole Beckerich. I mean, it really took me a long way. But to come back and find out that all along, a lot of my clients, a lot of my clients, they've been dealing with trauma. Mm -hmm. And how we, how we find out, uh, how I went back and looked at the situation, we have an education, we have a GED program also that we recruit for. So again, we try to take care of the holistic part of the individual. Seeing babies of parents I used to bring to OIC with their kids, now I see them as they have, they have kids and they are coming in with the same, almost the same problem. So by doing the counseling session, it's very important that we understand that we can picture the many ways or the many means of trauma. 
You can be traumatized at an instant and don't even know it. So unless you are able to recognize it, you will not be able to help that individual. So it's very important that the training that we have also so we are able to serve the clients much better. I go to the jails, the mm -hmm. test in the jails. Yeah. If he has been in jail now, their parents been in jail. So if something has happened, maybe they have seen their parents go to jail and they think that's the way, that's the norm. So the change of the individual is very much needed and we have to be able to recognize. I would say one, oh, one of them, like, and, I, and I will piggyback on because now what we're seeing is uh, trauma-informed practice, all right? And also, um, some of my experience, you know, when I was in New York, um, treatment adherence was a big, a big part. And getting our um, patients to be able to, because, you know, they're sick, they're not feeling well, and they may come in and get the medicine or whatever the case may be in the treatment, and then you don't see them for a couple of more weeks. But what we did was we really started to do an advocacy of group. Um, with people, with patients who felt that they wanted to come, you know, because again, it was, you know, it's confidential like status, but the fact that, that they would be able to come to a place where they could share some of the challenges that they were going through, you know, sometimes they were sick, sometimes it was just the fact that, you know, I just can't, I just, I'm depressed, so mental health care, so that, that, that kind of peer support, um, which is another thing we did with the case management program, but peer support, someone who was going through it, you know, um, to be able to, yeah, mm -hmm. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much. That so, uh, take away Thank you. So, I'm glad to be here today. I'm Sally Permar from Duke University. I'm a pediatrician and an infectious disease physician, and also a vaccine researcher. And um, my work in HIV is on um, developing immune inter interventions for the prevention of HIV in maternal and infant populations, um, as well as um, immunotherapies. And so I lead a, a preclinical vaccine program with colleagues at UNC um, studying novel vaccines in the infant and maternal immune system. And so I should point out that this is this is a space where UNC and Duke actually work together. No, we all actually see all the time with all of us at Harvard. So, so we, we actually go. We, so uh, um, as this, my name is Mike Cohen, as, as was noted earlier. Uh, for this discussion, I'm going to change my phenotype. I, I run, I have the privilege of, of directing the NIH's HIV Prevention Trials Network for the United States. So we, we develop innovative strategies for prevention um, at sites all over the world. There's a global perspective and a domestic perspective. I think what's important for our discussion today are, are just a couple of things. The, this network is divided into developing new tools and then integrating the tools into integrated strategies for prevention. Those integrated strategies are important because they embrace what was already discussed a little bit. It, the chance of somebody in our risk pool having kidney disease from hypertension is probably just as great as the chance of getting HIV. So we, we integrate beyond just the HIV care. We try and bring together diabetes and hypertension and a lot of other diseases as a, as a, a hook to bring people into much more integrated care. The tools, I think, are important because new tools are coming that are really important to our discussion. Within a year, I suspect, there will be injectable antiretroviral therapy for treatment of a combination of drugs, an integration inhibitor, and another drug that will be given either every four or every eight weeks. So that's going to be the sea change in treatment. That some people who have trouble taking pills will then go on to get these injectable treatment programs. For couples where one person's positive, the other person's negative, you can imagine that would be a really great tool because then the U equals U campaign is fully realized because companies have an injection that really doesn't allow for breakthrough viremia because there's no dependence on daily pills. Mm -hmm. the, one of these drugs, cabotegravir, is being developed for prevention at least at the most every eight weeks and maybe it is an implant for once every six months or once a year. So as, as we agonize over persist, uh, creating an environment where people who need PrEP can take it persistently, such as perhaps some high, very high risk of populations, these kind of long acting agents are tools that we're really excited about. The, the, the tool of treatment is going to be available in a year. The tool for prevention is probably only two years away if everything works out. We're running giant clinical trials on 177 sites all over the world to try and prove these tools will be available. Um, so that's what we're doing in it. I think that's the most probably credible thing for innovation right now. So I'm trying to think of how to explain what I'm doing as having any relevance to anybody in this room anytime soon. 
Um, we're working on the, working on constructing therapies that could cure HIV or eradicate it. Um, so obviously, a lot of the, all the stuff we've been talking about today is current, now, important, practical things. Uh, we're working on things that um, are really several steps down into the future. Hopefully, not more than a decade, but maybe more than that. That's great. And just to kind of just kind of pick up on this and to contextualize for folks a little bit too, um, the work that I'm doing right now, the research that I'm doing right now, is actually around community engagement for HIV clinical trials. So maybe that's where the relevance really sort of also too can come in, where we're doing that bridging work between um, the researchers who are doing work that you know can be the more recent uh, things that will be available in a couple of years, and then the work that's yet to come further down the line, but that still needs to be um, generating a lot of engagement with in the here and now, right? So um, can I ask a little what David said? Yeah, yeah. I speak for David, which I, I so so one of the issues is every ten years. HIV treatment changes dramatically. Mm -hmm. You have to kind of see that in your mind. A university of fatal disease in 85, by 95 there's a drug, AZT. But then shortly thereafter there's three drugs that get rid of some of the problems with the single drug of AZT. That's 95. 2005, all of that's going into one pill a day. That one pill a day is really earth shaking. And, and a one pill a day that's only $75 a year outside the United States. You know, So that changes the world of the disease. 2015 now, we're into believing we're going to have long-acting treatment, whether it's injections or implants. We're not going to depend on once a day pills. What David's doing, though, is the 2025 thing. Whether he cures HIV or not, I hope he does, but there will be drugs to put people into remission. This is like the same as the cancer field. And the movement towards remission is really where, and I know you don't like that because you'd like to have a sterilized <laughs> cure, there will be people who will come off treatment the long windows of time, and we'll be then a different world in 25. But I think at the, at the longest now. So you might want to argue about the time frames, but. The time, yeah, the time frame could be some very surprising thing in just a few years, or some mm -hmm. disappointing thing in a long just have to see. So I think, the, I think my issue or message, my, you know, of your importance <coughs> is that, um, it is a continuum, and all of these things are connected. And we can't work on any one thing. We have to work on them together. And to get to the very end, we have to keep going for I, I need to add one more thing. <laughs> <laughs> no, the risk for her, the PrEP thing. The PrEP thing with tenofovir, all those labs are a function of the drug tenofovir. PrEP is, right now, the only drug for PrEP is tenofovir. And the labs are a function of the drug. If the integrase inhibitors are fully developed, as we think they will be, they require much less lab monitoring. They'll almost certainly be given shots at Walgreens, no offense to a Walgreens or CVM, let's be status neutral. They'll be given probably at drugstores, not in a clinic, and they won't require lab monitoring. It'll be the cost of the prep will be the cost of the drug. So it's very drug specific. And I, yeah, I just wanted to um, think that these are all exciting innovations that are going on, but one uh, there are populations, as we discussed, that are being left out of some of the implementing these um, innovations. And one of those is children, and one of those is pregnant women. And in fact, the, the recent UNAIDS report um, that came out had the statement that children are being left behind. And I think they're being left behind in two areas. One is in research. So we don't quickly um, go from safety studies in adults into these special populations where the efficacy may be completely different. So you could be throwing out the baby with the bathwater if you just try your novel vaccine in an adult population when we know that infants have a very different immune system. And actually we found out with the HPV vaccine that children respond much better than adults to that type of vaccine. So that's some of my work is to figure out is there a benefit to using these novel vaccines in a younger population. So they're being left behind in research and then also in treatment implementation. So Mike talked about the um, triple combination uh, therapy that's in one pill. That's not available for kids, mm -hmm. right? Kids grow over time, they need different doses. They can't swallow pills. And so things are very slow to get down to that younger population. And um, this is globally, but it's also in the US as well. And we have so few uh, pediatric providers and that's you know a challenge with pediatric medicine and how we fund healthcare. And so, so I think um, while all of these innovations are coming through, we need to think about with our policy um, makers across the table, um, how can we more quickly get these um, interventions to those populations that are suffering from the disease, but we don't have as many tools to use there.
That's a great segue actually into the next question, which is, I, I think you might be seeing a theme here. This is similar questions that are going to be asked of each uh, panel today. But what are the, I mean, you all work in different segments of the HIV clinical research world. What are the current challenges facing your particular <coughs> field of research? Mm -hmm. um, so, the, I think the challenges are really the challenges that I sort of alluded to. Mm -hmm. The scientific challenges towards moving towards remission or cure are really considerable. Um, but there's a lot of um, room to grow and a lot of people working in the field and I think a lot of promise. Mm -hmm. um, I think the problem is, the challenge is, essentially persistence and attention and that there is you know funding and effort and priority that uh, you know sort of continues on these difficult problems um, without um, trying to make again the statement that it's not a continuum in the areas of research are, are interconnected. Mm -hmm. So I think um, you know we have World Day Day once a year um, but it needs more than one I think for for um, kind of work we're doing, the, the, we've done so great over 30 years. It's just amazing that you can take one pill a day and that pretty pretty well tolerated for most people, and and you just live a normal life. So the problem then, the research we're doing related to treatment, has to do with finding people who are not getting who are not getting tested and not getting treatment. So most of our integrated work in the United States in particular, is what are called hard to reach populations. Because the, those are the people who come in with HIV, which we find uh, HIV infection, uh, AIDS, as a tragedy. Every one of those is just like unbelievable. I mean, the physicians who do this talk about it when they see a patient who has not been treated. Because it just is such a failure of detection. And those same groups of people represent risk of ongoing transmission. Um, and um, and the spigot of people susceptible to HIV is forever, right? Because everyone is going to be susceptible to HIV. So, for the biggest challenge is the hard to reach populations, providing strategies to find and treat those people. For the HIV negative population, the development of new tools, the biggest problem is again success. Because we have tools that work, we now have to compare one thing to another thing. And when we compare one thing to another thing, and both things work the number of study subjects you need to do the research is tens of thousands. I don't know if that makes sense. In other words, we cannot delay you from getting Truvada prep. So if we're going to develop something better than Truvada prep, then we need a lot more people. There's no placebos anymore. We're done with placebos. And so uh, it's a challenge of study design to, to develop any new tool. Um, and that's, that's hard for us. Mm -hmm. So what I see as a challenge is continuing to resource prevention. So prevention is the most effective and um, efficient way to um, reduce the, the burden of an epidemic. And I think you know, we don't yet have examples where we have treated our way out of an epidemic. Um, I think it will come from having primary prevention, which we have some tools um, that we talked about today, but you know, eventually a vaccine. And it's difficult to um, incentivize those programs when they're not going to be something that people take over and over again. And so industry is less interested in the prevention strategies. Mm -hmm. And so we need to, you know, think about that with the government resources, how we can better um, resource and, um, and uh, you know, get those companies interested in the um, development of prevention. And of course, continuing the basic research, which we still need, unfortunately, the HIV vaccine has been a humongous challenge. It has not been um, as simple as the smallpox vaccine or the measles vaccine was. And so we need to continue that basic work, uh, as well as working with our government and industry partners. Mm -hmm. Well, speaking of resources, I mean, in each of your different fields, where would you like to see more resources going in order to move that research and that innovation forward, to take that next step in innovation, basically? Are there areas where you can see, like, you should be prioritizing this uh, over this? Or where, where would you like to see, uh, I mean, are, are there any neglected areas that need more resources? I don't think that I don't think that huge more additional resources should be invested in secure research than are being are being invested. I think it's would be 
think the challenge is actually to maintain the current level of right. research. I mean, we have essentially a, a crisis of, keep, of young people coming up in science and in clinical translation, um, trying to support them through all of the training and all of the hurdles and trying to keep funding for their training and the research around what they're doing go. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that would be I would deploy those resources generally, not something to say that we need a huge, greater investment in the pure research than that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to have to introduce another idea So for the resources, because we, we really are pretty much committed in a particular direction we're going to talk about. That is, we need a vaccine, so I, I agree with Sally. If we really want to get rid of HIV forever, there needs to be a vaccine. We failed to make a vaccine for a whole bunch of reasons. Vaccine, when you give a vaccine, it's called active immunity. So everybody who's gotten a vaccine, their immune system is stimulated, and then you don't get measles or mumps or rubella. But there's another way of understanding immunity, and that's called passive immunity, where we infuse an antibody. Like for rabies, if you're bitten by a rabid animal, we give an antibody passively that's against rabies and it captures the rabies virus. The HIV field has moved towards testing passively antibodies that prevent HIV. Those antibodies can be given probably every six months or even less. It's another kind of prep. But those antibodies also inform vaccine development. So if the antibodies work, a whole other group of investigators, including many at Duke, are working on the idea that the passive immunity informs a whole new way of doing active immunity and a way to make the vaccine. Dr. Haynes, my partner for 30 years, and, and I guess your boss at some level, um, <laughs> he's, he's one of the leaders in the world in, in this kind of thinking of bringing together passive immunity and active immunity around antibodies that prevent infection. These antibodies will probably be a product in two or three years, maybe four years. Uh, the resources are already committed at a huge level to this marriage of PrEP with antibodies and vaccine development. And I think that's, a, that's appropriate right now because that's the way forward for us. The antivirals are the industry are making antivirals. NIH and the Gates Foundation are supporting antibodies. And those are all the partners in the way forward. If that makes sense, I hope, mm -hmm. at some level. Yes, yeah, so um, I'm also bought into the, um, the fact that we need to study not just the, the passive um, immune protection. I think that will be the stopgap between um, you know, having only therapy versus having some kind of a vaccine that it will not be permanent. It will be something you have to get repeatedly on, in some uh, duration. But, um, and, and then having that be the bridge towards an active vaccine. So, so continuing the, the basic programs, trying to understand how we can um, use our animal models, et cetera, to de-risk the clinical trials, because we can't keep paying for these humongous clinical trials. It has become a burden. And um, that, that Mike's running a lot of them and knows how much they cost. Um, and so, uh, so I think the basic work needs to continue around an active vaccine. But in the meantime, we have this opportunity with the passive vaccines. And again, getting them into um, other populations like pregnant women, where the disease is perpetuating in young women, um, one of the highest growing groups of uh, newly infected in the world. Those are also the women who are becoming pregnant and breastfeeding. And so it's a, it's a cycle. That is going, and so we need to make sure that it's getting into the adolescent population, the pregnant population, um, so that we can quickly move the needle on how many we're preventing. Okay, so the corporal is waiting on us, and we have only a few minutes left. Okay, okay. But I would like to make a comment. Is that a corporal? He, that wasn't. He is in the military. What was your, what was your rank? Not important. So, the major. Sorry. Um, it, so um, part of the question was about closer collaboration between research and policy makers. Yes. And um, I think we have a lot of people in the room who are either policy makers or policy practitioners and implementers. And so I think the other statement that should be made is that this kind of research needs to move forward with people from the community, with HIV infected volunteers in studies with other parts of the community as well. Mm -hmm. And so that's, I think, just something that, you know, maybe is obvious, but you know, needs to be said. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's sort of what today is about, right, is collaboration. And in a lot of my own work, it means collaborating between uh, researchers and community members. But um, uh, my final question for the three of you was, uh, in the topic of collaboration, is really about how do, um, 
what kind of additional opportunities do you see to potentially collaborate more between yourselves in the research world and policymakers specifically? Like that collaborative link, what, you know, what more could we be doing there to support ongoing innovation? Yeah, I think I think some of that was already said by by Mike as he sort of laid out the history of development, mm -hmm. um, where I think we have will have opportunities now to deploy things at the earliest possible moment in ways across the community that we can both improve care, but also evaluate how how various different approaches work best. Uh, I mean, I, I think for this group, I would emphasize that the state of North Carolina is totally, entirely unique. Um, the state leadership, regardless of who the administration was for the last 30 years, has been really forward thinking and collaborative and, and use their resources to kind of uh, experiment, to do things way before the CDC does them. And usually the CDC follows the state of North Carolina. And that's not true in other states. I, I can say, I think quite frankly, almost every state is jealous of North Carolina in terms of, 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 its, of its ability to take ideas and move policy forward. I think that that hour today, you would say, well, why am I here? Because I'm really interested in that hour we're spending today talking about strategies because we need to get to zero. We understand the problem in the state. The question is, how do we, the country has 44,000 new infections every year. My friend who runs the CDC program, John O'Merman, he indicates, as was said by Jacqueline earlier, this is about young gay black men. And yet we, we are afraid to really tackle that at a level that makes this zero. Mm. And I would like to hear how we do that. You know, what do we do in this state to get to zero? Would be tremendously exciting. And I think the state is committed to that. That there's an hour at one to two to talk about ideas. And those ideas have to come from the people who are here today. Um, and Dr. Bruner, you had mentioned specifically that link between policy and your research. Can you collaborate on that a little bit? Yeah, well, one opportunity I think that's coming to North Carolina, which um, can put it even further ahead, is um, the change in the um, our managed care structure, right? And, mm -hmm. and it's an opportunity for us to restructure, to think about how um, HIV care and prevention is uh, disseminated across the state. And so, you know, I think thinking with the policymakers of how we use value-based care over paying uh, for just um, a fee for service is a, a huge opportunity for North Carolina. We have a very uh, progressive thinking, um, our, our biggest uh, payer in the state, uh, Blue Cross Blue Shield. We have a progressive uh, DHHS. We, we have this change coming, and whether it's the best uh, option or worst option, we have an opportunity to, to go there. So I think thinking about how we can better uh, work on quality, which means preventing HIV infections, number of people on PrEP that really need it, number of people on treatment, number of children on treatment that are on the right dose and are you know, being controlled. So all those things we can incentivize from with policymakers that will actually move us towards getting to zero. <laughs> I think uh, do we? I think we still have some time for some questions from the floor. Um, yeah. I just have one comment. My comment is, in order for us to get to zero, we have to look at all the populations that are at risk. Many of the populations we've been discussing today are transgender and MSM. Heterosexual men and heterosexual women are also at risk. And I'm hoping that as we move forward with this discussion, that we will find ways to include these other populations. But we're going to truly, truly get to zero. And we say the most that might. I think something else that I'm sure we can get into this conversation is the social determinants of health. And things, the bars, the four bars in our cascades, the, the effect where you get into care, where you get tested, where you stay in care, where you choose medication, and virus suppression. Because there's a lot of other things. There's, there's housing, there's access, there's transportation, et cetera, et cetera. So, being able to look at the determinants, the social and structural determinants of health is really, really critical in terms of ending the epidemic and getting to zero. Uh, I, I think the other thing that's terribly important is cultural competence. That, that's about the idea of filling up in the test or your doctor appointment and feeling that your doctor, your nurse, your receptionist, your case manager are all non judgmental. Yes. Whoever you are, whatever you are experiencing, that you're not going to be judged. And we see that especially for our innocent population, for our people of color, and especially for our transgender population. We have to pay attention to that issue of competence. Mm -hmm. Thank you.
Okay. Here's a comment. Yeah, yeah, so yeah, so just, just a lot here. I uh, <laughs> wanted to ask about um, well, the three of you are each other providers. And so I wanted to see what you really think about the injectables that are coming. Because right now, the pill that I'm prescribing to the majority of my patients is about the size of a Tic Tac. And so I'm thinking ahead. I talked to them about injectables. But the fact that they're going to be every two months that they have to drive into our Duke parking lot, pay eight, eight bucks for parking. And then, yeah, there's, yeah, that's the answer. And do you think from a higher level, is someone thinking through the logistics of actually pushing out the injectables? Because I, you mentioned Walgreens, but are they set up for this? Like what happens if the person comes in too late and misses their window? And so is this something that we should be thinking about? Because that will certainly help implementation if we think about now. Can I just answer that? Yes. The answer is yes. <laughs> yeah, people are thinking a lot about this. You, what you, every little aspect of this is the subject of tremendous kind of thought about why you spend 100, $180 million to develop a thing if no one's ever going to use it, plus there's a profit motive. So, yes, people are thinking about everything you just read. And it's not going to be, it's not going to replace pills. There's still going to be people on pills. Thank you. Um, so, there's two, there's two concepts that have emerged today too that I, I want to be able to grab onto and then talk about more after lunch. And one has to do with energy. We, there is, there is, it's, a little, it's still a little quiet compared to some folks that I know and what they're capable of here. I mean, I know you and we, we certainly can hype the energy up when we want. And, but it takes energy given all the needs in North Carolina, you know, to remind people at the local level, state level, national level, that we still count, that the HIV epidemic is not over, and that we are posed at this amazing <coughs> moment in history where we're you know, this far away from vaccine and or cure, at the point where medication does save lives, and knowing what we know, which is that while many of us have benefited, there's a whole group of us who haven't yet. And if we want to fix that, that takes energy. Not, there's, I so this really, where did you go? There you are. So Allison's goal here today, and Jeremy, thank you very much, was to pull it together. The fact that we're sitting here in the governor's mansion together does not escape me, given that, you know, I've been doing this since I was a young child, right? Um, uh, this is awesome, because this says that North Carolina's highest leadership is making this a priority. And we have to be very respectful and grateful of that moment right now. But the empowerment piece, I was talking to my friend here from Wilson, we've known each other for a long time, is that when there's you come together in community meetings, right, Allison, this was your point. And and there are these barriers like transportation or there's these barriers of mistrust and lack of information. Like when I listen to this stuff about the clinical trials and how close you are, you, you know I'm just ready to pop off, I get so excited about this. Um, because we want to deliver in North Carolina the very best of what we have. You know, that this is, this is our home, this is who we are. And so from the very moment of the first case reported, we all came together when we had no resources and said, we're gonna, we're gonna make a difference here, and you have. But back to the empowerment, we can't sit in meetings together, right? where we've got care and prevention that we all fund and say that it's acceptable that when prevention needs outreach to go back out and bring somebody in who's not in care, that that's a problem or an issue. That's right. We can't let our budgets and our mm -hmm. contracts mm -hmm. and all of that stuff prevent us from having we're to go again. Okay. The dialogue, right, to say fix the barrier, yeah. you know, fix it. Because while there's some things that I would respectfully say we do need some more funding about, mm -hmm. and perhaps we can talk to MCAN about that and et cetera, but the community has to, has to make that work. They have to hear from you. Right. But I would say we're at the moment in history where the empowerment has to be very informed. Specifically, what do you want? What does it mean to fix transportation? What does it mean to fix housing? That's the moment we sit at, and I hope that's what we'll start talking about later this afternoon. Uh, yes, yeah. Uh, I just want to say I'm speaking from a black male from um, house there, uh, government house, little ridges. Uh, HIV is just not scary to us anymore. Mm -hmm. So um, when you come, you, when you go to our neighborhoods and you want to start talking about this prep and get tested, 
you're going to have to piggyback it in. Because it just ain't scary anymore. We got, we impressed, we're more worried about the next traffic stop. The blood, the creep. You don't have, you got to put this thing on the back of it, right? Slide it in. And we, no, we'll listen if we show a look of passion about what we really do. Absolutely. Yeah. You are, you see what's going on with That's us. That's right. That's right. It ain't HIV. It, it, it's it's going to be, it's, we know it's a problem. But we're just not scared of it anymore. Right. And then, and then y'all, you, you did so much work, man. Now you got to you can live forever with it. We're really not thinking about it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so it's, it's like it's, it's in the back seat now. Yeah. You need to get it back to the front, right. but you're going to have to pick it back at the end first. Right. Yeah, you're going to have to sneak it in on it. After, after the discussion, we're gonna, oh, by the way, we're going to have some testing over here. You should get tested. Mm -hmm. I, hate, I hate to. Minimize it like that. But that's what you're going to have to do now because in our neighborhoods where I'm from, HIV is not a topic. I think that's a great point to be thinking about throughout the rest of the day because as Allison said at the beginning of this, there are other health disparities that need to be addressed alongside HIV in order for us to ever truly get at the epidemic the way that we want to be doing, right? So I, I thank you for that point. I thank all the comments. And I also thank our listeners. thinking about kind of system change around um, the criminal justice, prison and jail systems, uh, to, to not only think about the challenges, but also, you know, potential opportunities and ways to move forward. Uh, we, we were very intentional about um, inviting some, some big hitters, some heavy hitters, um, thinking about this. Um, so we have Dr. Dana Rice, who has, um, she's new to North Carolina, but she has experience with thinking about how to innovate the way that we improve um, health care and, and HIV treatment in um, jail and prison populations. We have Lee Storo, who's the director, executive director of ne uh, North Carolina AIDS Action Network and has done some really um, groundbreaking work in, in uh, decriminalizing HIV disclosure and moving forward policy work and also working across you know, both uh, on, on, on both sides of the field in regards to politics and bridging the gap um, so that we can move forward and really changing some of the, um, you know, uh, issues around HIV in North Carolina. And we also have Asher Schrantz, who, who is um, a, a doctor and affiliated at UNC and also um, an expert in infectious disease and the opioid crisis. So thank you. Welcome. <laughs> Um, I'll give you, I know I did a little bit of an introduction, but if, if you want to give some um, kind of brief remarks on the current work that you're doing and um, maybe some introduction of yourself, go ahead. Sure, well, I'm set in the hot seat, so I'll go first. <clears throat> Hello, everyone. I'm uh, Dana Rice. I am a year and a half in the state, um, so I'm still learning um, about North Carolina, but I am faculty in uh, public health leadership at Gillings. Uh, UNC School of Global Public Health. And um, most of my work has um, involved developing um, and testing uh, strategies to connect those who have been incarcerated or who are incarcerated to novel interventions for both prevention as well as connecting folks to care um, in communities. Uh, because I think the incarcerated population has been one that really touches the vast, a vast majority of our population, those who have been marginalized, and have been left out of the connections. Um, what we know is that most people return to the communities in which they came from, and we need to do a better job of both um, identifying those who are um, in jails and prisons and connecting them to care and connecting them to treatment. And so I spent about 17 years um, developing testing programs to um, identify those who are HIV positive and connecting them to care in the Wayne County jails in Detroit, Michigan. Um, and so we went from having um, a very small testing program where we tested probably about 300 people per year to within about, um, I'd say about 18 months of bringing uh, rapid testing into the jails and having a permanent presence in the jails to over 18,000 people. And so we did that with four staff and people and connections with local public health and local community partners. And so what we 
what I teach students now is really one to understand the system because we don't understand the system. And this is one of the largest systems that touches health and touches people and touches lives that we're afraid of. And so I teach students now about how to understand these systems. Jails and prisons are different. Um, the way they operate is different. Um, populations who touch them are the same, but like we need to develop a better understanding. Providers, both community providers and internal providers need to, to connect better. And so my training is around bringing in, um, working with sort of new partners to engage in that work, to train students how to um, engage in that work better. Well, good morning, everybody. My name is Lee Storo. I've been the executive director at the North Carolina AIDS Action Network since 2014. The North Carolina AIDS Action Network is our statewide nonprofit, specifically focused on advocacy and lobbying efforts before the General Assembly, before the governor's staff, DHHS, related to issues of HIV treatment and prevention. And have started over the last couple of years to broaden our work into the hepatitis and broader STI space. I think there's certainly a number of policy wins that um, we've been proud to help lead, to be coalition partners on, to work with many of you in this room that we can really celebrate in North Carolina over the last decade. We were founded really out of a crisis in terms of our state's now HIV medication assistance program, formerly the AIDS drug assistance program. And in 2010, 2011, North Carolina had one of the longest waiting lists in the country and some of the strictest eligibility standards in terms of both income and drugs covered. Um, and are really proud that through bipartisan work with the governor's office, with the General Assembly, we're able to increase appropriations to now support a fully funded HIV medication assistance program, which is administered by our colleagues at the Division of Public Health. We've continued to be really strong advocates for HMAP. In 2016, we're able to secure the General Assembly approval to expand that program to cover health insurance for folks who hit certain income eligibility which was certainly a really exciting achievement um, in a time um, of Republican control in both the governor's office and the General Assembly. And in recent years, as I mentioned, have expanded our work to realize that if sort of what it means, I think, to address HIV in 2017 and 2018 really means embracing conversations about the opioid epidemic. And we're able to secure a $1.2 million appropriation over two years to increase the communicable disease branch funding related to testing and treating hepatitis. And I think, um, I know we're focused on HIV, but really just have to, in this day and age, lean into sort of the intersectionality. And I think as folks know that there's a high rate of co-infection of folks living with both HIV and hepatitis. Um, and as Allison mentioned, um, was really proud in 2017 to help lead along with Carolyn McAllister at Duke, the sort of public advocacy work that happened around supporting our Commission for Public Health and the Department of Health and Human Services effort to modernize our HIV criminal. So I think there's certainly a lot we can really celebrate and be excited about when it comes to HIV advocacy in North Carolina, and then certainly, of course, some obstacles ahead. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, so hey, everyone. My name is Asher Strands. I'm a fellow in infectious diseases at UNC in Chapel Hill. So in that role, uh, in part, I'm a researcher with a focus on the um, intersection of infectious diseases and substance use. Uh, and I'm also a clinician, so I see patients for HIV care in our clinic at UNC, and we state, uh, and then I also see inpatients uh, for infectious disease issues who are admitted at the hospital UNC. I think when we think about infectious diseases concerns of the opioid epidemic, um, they fall into two broad categories from my perspective. They're communicable diseases, that's HIV, hepatitis C, hepatitis B, and then there are the less transmissible infections, um, uh, and those are things like severe soft tissue infections, or skin infections, abscesses, and endocarditis, which is an infection of the heart valves that can occur from injecting drugs. Uh, while our focus today is on HIV, uh, none of these health issues exist in a vacuum. So the person who's admitted to the hospital with a severe heart valve infection is also someone who's at really high risk of acquiring HIV and also at risk of transmitting it to other people. Um, and then further down the continuum, there's also someone who's at risk of overdosing. Um, my uh, research has had two focuses. One is at looking at opioid misuse among people living with HIV who come to care at UNC. The other has been um, looking at some of those other severe infections like uh, heart valve infections. And I've been working with people at the state um, and uh, communicable, sorry, communicable diseases branch um, looking statewide at this emerging problem of, um, of uh, 
endocarditis or heart, severe heart valve infections related to injection drug use. On the clinical side, I'm also interested in working on ways that we can tackle um, the challenge of providing addiction care uh, and harm reduction services to uh, this population who are often young, uninsured, and come from remote parts around the state. Thank you. Um, okay, so we, you know, we have the similar questions um, from previous panels that I will open up. What are some of the current challenges that exist related to your field in HIV? Dan, can go first. Um, well, I was really pleased to hear just a moment ago that um, there's an increased awareness and talk about understanding the social determinants of health. Um, and the concept of sort of health in all policies, how the policies we create impact health outcomes, and how we need to really broaden our scope in, in our understanding of the things that impact people's health. And so I think one of the challenges is that we need to do better at engaging um, uh, lay people, policymakers on what that really means around bringing health care, uh, health lens to the policies that we make. And I think it's particularly important to do that when we think about the criminal justice system and understanding communities' interaction with the criminal justice system and how the criminal justice system sort of operates um, in a, it, it operates on its own with very little engagement from the public health community and very little engagement from um, the provider community. And um, I think we really need to do a better job around making those connections um, more deliberate. Mm -hmm. um, I think we also need to do a better job of engaging individuals who have experienced incarceration and bringing them into the process. They have lived experience um, around how to connect with these communities better. And so I, I think part of it is getting, getting grounded in understanding these systems and then being more deliberate about collaboration. I'm a pracademic. I like to say. So I'm a practitioner at heart um, and, and working in academia where I try to make these linkages between understanding what the research says and then what happens on the ground, what, what happens really. And so I think um, the more we can have the conversations about why people are entering the criminal justice system in the first place, which places them at risk, um, this sort of intersectionality um, concept is, is, I think, a great first step for us to, to do, to tackle both at the state level and um, at the national level. And I also think creating sort of these non-traditional partnerships with leaders in the criminal justice system and public health leaders to work collaboratively. There are, um, I've been working with some, um, our the public health director in Granville Vance County who has partnered with um, the local sheriffs there to engage in, um, Primarily, it started to address mental illness and to create diversion programs for those who are mentally ill who are being pushed into the system, but they quickly realized that this population is the same population, right? And we know co-occurring disorders happen where people who are mentally ill are also using drugs and opioids, and they can't address one thing without addressing the other. And the sheriffs needed to raise their awareness about what's happening. I mean, they're seeing it on the ground, but they don't know how to treat it, and or is that their expertise or their job? And so, but it is our job to make sure that those who are touching these communities are fully aware of what they can and cannot do and who they should partner with to improve the outcomes for our populations. Mm -hmm. um, just before we move on to the other panelists, uh, part of the, the, in preparation for today's event, I also tried to make sure that we spoke with people who are living with HIV and have been formerly incarcerated um, and you know, make sure that we have representation in this room also from people who formerly incarcerated. And you know, some of the challenges that we've heard about, Durham County uh, Health Department is, is unique in the sense that they also have a partnership with the local jail. And we know that you know, even though people may be getting tested once they go in to jail, they, they may not be there long enough to get access to treatment while they're in jail. Or you know, there's difficulties around um, getting the medical providers into the jails or, or, you know, paying for transportation for those incarcerated individuals to go see the medical providers. And so those are also challenges that I think are important for us to think about and discuss as well. Absolutely. I mean, I think that, um, first of all, in public health, at least before I started working in the field, I didn't understand the difference between a prison and a jail, right? And the fact that 
jails are sort of short-term facilities where people have been, are pre-adjudicated. They're not necessarily there because they've been sentenced, right? They're there, they, um, there's really short stays. And so the type of care that you provide to individuals who are in jail, the services you need to connect them to are very different than those that are in prison settings, right? Which are long-term um, facilities where you may, if someone ha is there with HIV, you may be able to connect them to care and treatment and sustain them. So, so the challenge is, once they get out, how do we maintain that, right? Mm -hmm. With someone with the recycling, with the revolving door, um, in a jail setting that happens so quickly, how we need to partner and engage looks very different. I teach a class now on criminalization um, and its impact on health outcomes for marginalized populations. I'm teaching a course on mass incarceration and public health. This is the first time a class like this has been offered mm -hmm. at the School of Public Health uh, for public health practitioners. And um, you know, we're in 2018, you incarcerate more people than anywhere in the world. Um, and so I think that part of getting providers into these settings and to connect with these human beings um, and to create programs that connect them to treatment and care is, is really important mm -hmm. and critical. So, you know, thank you for your point. Uh, uh, just to repeat the question, what are the current challenges that exist related to your field? Um, yeah. I sort of found myself like reflecting in the conversation today about, it sort of feels like a moment, right? We're at the end of 2018, we have a new General Assembly commencing in 2019, thinking for me and my agency about like what is possible in 2019, because I want to ditto everything that has been said around stigma, about intersectionality, about the need for housing, for transportation, but if I sort of reflect back and say the current HIV movement size to the size that we are, like resource to where we are. I do sort of keep coming back to what Secretary Cohen reflected on in terms of closing the coverage gap and expanding mm -hmm. Medicaid. You know, I know we're trying to focus a bit on the opioid and sort of prison conversation, but even with that setting, right, like getting folks who are battling addiction access to health insurance, getting folks who are dealing with hepatitis access to health insurance. Um, if we expanded Medicaid, we would move a significant number of folks on HIV medication assistance program who are not eligible to get full health insurance onto full health insurance programs. Low income individuals who are interested in accessing PrEP could be able to have their lab costs significantly subsidized if we expanded Medicaid. Yeah. So I think like if I, as I reflect on the work we're going to do and sort of the movement as a whole, and there was one thing that I could sort of wave a magic wand and make happen, and I sort of think is realistic, right? Like my magic wand would probably be like instant pot but I'm not sure how exactly to do that. Um, I think it is possible given the current makeup and the bully pulpit that the governor and the Department of Health and Human Services has that we could close the Medicaid gap and expand Medicaid in 2019. Yeah, um, I don't know if I'm gonna have a ton more to say because um, I think a lot of these themes that have been brought up earlier today and just now really apply to kind of the population of interest that I'm focused on as well. Um, so I'll just say really briefly, through my lens, when thinking about the opioid crisis in HIV, there's kind of two major challenges. One is to say, well, how does the opioid crisis, how has that affected people who have HIV and is it different than the regular, the rest of the population? Um, and uh, alternatively, uh, is a question of HIV prevention and preparedness, um, you know, how does the opioid crisis or the associated increase in injection drug use put North Carolina at risk for a major outbreak of HIV that was seen uh, in rural Indiana a few years ago. Um, so regarding the first question about um, the opioid crisis impacting people living with HIV, I'll just say we don't really totally know the whole picture from the work I've done looking at people who are engaged in care. Despite receiving really high doses of opioids um, and frequent prescriptions for opioids, people living with HIV don't necessarily have high rates of opioid misuse. Uh, but again, that's missing the people who are not engaged in care, not coming to appointments. And those are people who may be more likely to have comorbid mental illness, comorbid substance use disorders, a high risk of injecting drugs, and more likely to um, uh, not be on medications and uh, uh, not have a suppressed viral load. Regarding the second question of preparedness um, in terms of an outbreak of HIV, I think North Carolina is actually a little bit ahead of the game, um, at least if you compare to how things were in Indiana a few years ago. Uh, 
In the past few years, North Carolina has legalized syringe exchange, syringe services program, syringe exchanges, um, and that was identified as a major um, element that helped stem the outbreak in Indiana. And not only do we have them legalized, but there's a very, they have a very active voice in the state, and they're growing and they're covered around the state. Um, with that said, uh, I do think the infrastructure to meaningfully, holistically treat addiction um, beyond harm reduction is uh, uh, there are major treatment gaps there. And part of that stems from the fact that the population is largely uninsured. People who are um, injecting drugs or using drugs and at risk of HIV infection, a lot of them are the people who would be great targets for Medicaid expansion. They're young and low income and otherwise uninsured. Um, so I do think, um, uh, you know, being able to get the medications and the infrastructure to the people at risk can be thought of as an HIV prevention issue um, in terms of gaining addiction care to them. Uh, and again, this goes back to something I think was brought up during the prep session of, well, we have these great robust services for our population with HIV who are living with HIV now, but for the very high risk groups, sometimes that's not necessarily always there for them. Um, and so uh, again, you know, thinking of what we can do to kind of enhance the wraparound services for the at risk population is, uh, is again important when thinking about people with substance use disorders. Thank you. Um, so we have seven, six minutes. <laughs> six. Uh, we have six minutes. Um, I would like to open it up to the group, I, and also think I think you all kind of addressed the second question about opportunities and ways to think about how we could address these issues. Um, so also moving the conversation forward in that way, how do we think about creative ways to address these issues? Yes, Mr. Williams. Now, um, there are ideals in their realities. Yeah. I think the gentleman over here really underscored <laughs> the realities. Um, that to think that the millions of, of men and women have been incarcerated and have been disenfranchised, mm -hmm. have lost their right to vote, to yes. serve on a jury, to get educational funds, are going to go into and be interested in, in HIV testing and treatment, they're looking to get their rights restored yeah. as productive citizens. And I've worked in the, in the penitentiary for six years. Uh, I've uh, gotten a grant uh, to supervise um, federal uh, parolees, and they're not interested. Mm -hmm. They're interested in, in about getting those rights restored. They're, they're interested in getting uh, uh, to be able to re-enter uh, re back in the community. They're interested in reuniting with their families. Mm -hmm. Until you can address those issues, and you really vividly underscore that, they're not interested in, in, uh, in that. I mean, at minimally. Uh, interested in that, and that's something we're not hearing in the narrative. Um, you mentioned that we incarcerate more people than China, the Soviet Union, and Turkey combined. When crime rate is down, when many of the um, people who are in prison now have been sentenced under these truth and sentencing laws uh, for marijuana conviction, and now we're hearing that marijuana is medicinal, and you're languishing in prison and you have a, a prison record that you can't, that bar you from getting these services, we're talking about a lot of anger. Mm -hmm. uh, and until we uh, address that head on, until we find a way at a, at a national level, I think President Obama tried to, mm -hmm. to put some um, policies in place to maybe have a, have a graduated, uh, some rights restored in terms of um, uh, when you get a, when you, uh, on a job application, not asking you, if you've been arrested or if you've been a, a felony conviction. I think until we um, address those issues, we're talking about a population between uh, people incarcerated now or under some kind of uh, criminal supervision, we're talking about six or seven million people. That's a lot of the population. Until we put some national strategies in terms of advocating for these people, we're, we're uh, fighting a battle uh, from under the Thank you. So we have um, two more comments, uh, Mr. Harding and Alexandra Anderson. Yeah, um, I'm going to say something real quick. Um, the first time I got high, a, a dog in the military gave me the um, medication. That was the first time I got high. Need to say, after I got on and started drinking with him, it wasn't the last time I got high, which ended up costing me a military career. Okay, the last time I got high, I was my dog. Hmm. And I, I was using cocaine. And here's the thing. 
when I was done with it, and I came out and I wanted help, and I went to VR. They told me since I had not been using it, I didn't qualify to get any help. Since I hadn't been using it, so what they, what they told me essentially was if I had got out and went back to doing what I was doing, then I could have showed up and they would have helped me. But since I wanted something different in my life, and I did something different, I was no longer qualified for any of them services. Damn thing, he, he's absolutely right. When we, we're coming out, all we want is to reconnect with our families, a chance to make a decent, decent salary where we can try to get back in these kids' lives or get them child support, support people off their backs so you ain't got to turn around and go right back. Mm -hmm. So help, we're not, we're not, and focus on whether we're going to die or not right then. But here's the thing, the medication they give us when we come out the gate is for 30 days. Mm -hmm. If you are a diabetic, a serious diabetic with no insurance or or and or, or if you need some 30 days of medication I had a friend of mine go blind from diabetes because he ran, he ran out of medication and, they, and, they, and since he was he didn't go back to get in trouble he didn't qualify for these programs that so-called they tell us about that's gonna help us when we get out now my wife is living with us I went everywhere trying to get some help Everywhere, unemployment office, everywhere. I even tried to have a free program where they send the guys to their CDLs. I didn't qualify, you know why? Because I wasn't screwed up anymore. Yeah. But if I'd have stayed screwed up, they would have helped me. If it wasn't for a family who picked me up and didn't disown me, I'd be back doing what I do worse. Mm -hmm. that's, exactly, that, that's exactly how I felt at times. Like, I'm like, screw it. Yeah. I tried. Mm -hmm. So it takes a lot, and, and, but it goes come to the individual too. You gotta have faith, you gotta have perseverance, you gotta keep going. You gonna call we, when you come out of prison, you hear no more than you hear yes. And that first year out is your hardest year of your life. I don't care what you was into, that's the hardest time of your life. Because nobody wants to be the first person to take a chance on you. And everybody's so sure you're gonna go back to what you're doing. So oh, let, let me say this right here. Public defenders are not our friends. I did almost 16 years in prison for less than a gram of cocaine. All because I couldn't afford a boy. Why I couldn't afford a boy? Because I was borderline junkie. I was yeah. getting high. I was no dope dealer. Mm -hmm. But instead of getting me treatment, the court said, hey, lock them up. We'll get high in the moment. They were absolutely right. I did. So to your point, the, the eligibility criteria and the policies that we have created oftentimes keep people out. And many of the, the policies and the procedures that we have created and the interventions that we have created make the assumption that it is up to the individual to pursue resources, but oftentimes those people get get the closed door. And so that, that is something that we also have to think about when we're creating these policies and, and these interventions. Uh, we have to close and then, uh, so Alexandria, and then we wrap it up. So I just wanted to bring it up to the panel because it's a criminal justice panel. Can you panel. come over because like, people can't hear? Right, a criminal justice panel um, talking about the labeling theory where we label individuals as, at, like how we do most of the time, how we've done today, at risk or, um, or uh, previously incarcerated. And having those labels kind of brings them into this stigmatized stereotype. Um, what are some innovative ways that you think that we can do changing the language? Because we already changed some of the language for HIV. Like ADAP is not HMAS to take away AIDS because people who have HIV don't always have AIDS. Right. Um, so what are some innovative ways to kind of break down these labelings that we typically use to be more inclusive and provide a broader range of health care and not just being, being aware of particular populations, but um, trying to be inclusive so we're not putting them back in those same boxes. Well, uh, so we don't have time to answer that question, but one thing <laughs> that we could think about is, you know, we, we label people as men, but we label people based on their behavior. Formerly, or, uh, you know, formerly incarcerated, or men who have sex with men, or whatever, when it really is people who need medication, people who need help. Right, and so if we think, if we reframe the way that we are also labeling them, that could, I mean, that's just one thought. But or how we're thinking about it. How we're thinking about it, yeah. And sometimes people stay in prison 
right. because they can get medication in right. prison. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then I think yeah. you had one more thing about family. You were very lucky to yeah. have, be able to have a family structure, yeah. but a lot of people don't. You have people mm -hmm. in prisons and jails that can't get out because they owe a dollar. Or they yeah. owe 500000 yes. and they can't get out. Yeah. So, yeah. All right. Thank you so much to our panel. My title is less about secretary, more about mom. Um, my two girls are sitting in the other room, so um, there's only so long I can really bribe them with, you know, snacks. Uh, so I appreciate you letting me shake up the schedule a little bit here today. And what a great, great day to be here at the mansion. So first, welcome on behalf of the governor here. What a beautiful space for us to be talking about a really challenging and important topic, but luckily this beautiful space. Um, that we want to make sure that you feel welcome in, and it's wonderful to see it decorated for the holidays. So, um, you know, this is an important day. Uh, we've been celebrating World AIDS, World AIDS Day for many years at this point, right? And there's a lot of progress that's made. I know we want to talk about the things we need to do better, and there's a lot that we can continue to make progress on, but we have to stop and pause for a moment about how much progress has really been made. Mm -hmm. And I got involved working on HIV and AIDS issues as a medical student 20 years ago. I spent a number of months in South Africa uh, working on community wellness programs there and community outreach workers uh, to help with the epidemic in South Africa. I went back there as a doctor, as a resident um, for another uh, two months, to now as a doctor to do more care. Um, so this is an issue that has been with me for a very long time. Not many of you have worked on this for your entire careers for decades, and thank you for all of that hard work. Um, so as we take a moment to reflect on the incredible advancements, both in science and in medicine, but in the infrastructure of how we've gotten to be able to get folks access to care, um, a lot of great advancements, right, with our medicines and getting to viral suppression and making this a chronic disease instead of one that was a certain death sentence, right? That's a lot to be proud of. But let's talk about what else we need to do, right? And I heard that in the last panel, a lot of work to do. And I think that does start with understanding about access to care, right? And it's not just at the point when you get sick. We want to make sure folks have access to care throughout their lives, right? And there's, the governor's been talking about one simple word that can change that for thousands and thousands of North Carolinians, and that word is yes. That's what we need to hear from the General Assembly when it comes to the issue of closing the coverage gap. Yes. 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 We've waited too long to make sure we can get another half a million North Carolinians access to care. Um, we're lucky that we have a lot of ways to provide care for those who have HIV and AIDS, but we know that that means there's a lot of disparities, particularly for our communities of color, right? So access to care is only the first step, but we got to get there first. Then we really need to think about our system overall, right? And how are we making sure that once folks have that insurance card, that they can access the care that they need in their communities and get the care that they need to be well, um, and to make HIV and AIDS a chronic disease that we know it, it, it can be. Um, so we have a lot of work to do there. So our, our um, department is focused on not just access to care and strengthening our Medicaid program and fighting the opioid crisis and investing in early childhood education, but really thinking very broadly about what it means to be healthy. And that's much more than what happens in the four walls of a hospital and a clinic. Right? As much as I'm a physician, I know that your health matters so much more about what's going on at home and in your community uh, than what's happening inside the four walls of where someone may, may see me. And so we are definitely take, um, are taking a very broad view of health. And I encourage you to do that as you think about your further conversations and ways that we need to improve over the course of today. Right? We have to think about food security housing security, transportation, violence, access to good, high-paying jobs, right? So all of those things, that, that is health and human services, right? And so those are the things that we are focused on every day as we use our levers. But this is gonna take, take a village uh, to move this work forward. So we need access to care, and we need a little word that, that's said by the General Assembly, and that's yes. And then we need to get to work using that access to care to make sure that that, that access is real for folks no matter what zip code you're born in, no matter the color of your skin, 
We need to make sure that that access is, is real for folks. And then we have to think broadly, really, about what drives someone's health. So I'm really happy you all are gathered here today for this. As I said, I wish I could be here for this full conversation. It is an issue that is close to me personally um, that I've been working on for a number of years. But like I said, mom, mom hat is on today. My <laughs> husband is traveling off playing soccer on the other part of the state. And so, you know, we're making, we're making it work. <laughs> um, so thank you for letting me spend a few minutes with you. Thank you for spending your weekend time here really digging into your heart issues so that we can make our, stealth, our whole state healthier. So thank you again. Happy holidays. Housing, yeah. Housing. All right, so make sure I get this right. I'm just reporting out what we talked about. Just, your just to, 
a top two. So, um, well, number one by far was um, safe and affordable housing. So, yes. as we know, housing is a, deter a social determinant of health. Yep. If you don't have housing, you can't get education. You certainly don't have access to health care. Um, and for folks who need stable access for treatment, one of our group members brought up um, that, especially when you have a serious disease, being able to be stable is very important um, for your continued um, health. Uh, the second bad, big thing, I mean, safe and affordable is really big. So I should call those two things, right? So one is that you're a housing that you can afford. And two, we also know that the housing that you can afford is not always safe. And so for somebody who's immunocompromised, uh, exposure to asbestos and lead or housing that is um, not well insulated so you get cold um, affects your health. So, so uh, before we do this, the, the, the proclamation thing, um, and now is a part of the conversation where we get to decide as a community, as a combined community, what we do together. Um, this is a, a intersectional uh, crowd, and we've got folks who all work in and around HIV AIDS, but also are experts in a number of different areas. So this is the space where we really can think for a few minutes about, um, you know, not only beyond this convening, do we want to convene again, um, but, you know, uh, not just in the government space. I mean, how do we want to be proactive about pulling these necessary parties together in the community space uh, to, uh, to advance this agenda? Secretary Cohen touched on this earlier when she said the legislature could say yes, but she's saying yes to Medicaid expansion. Um, what, what are the things that we can be doing that are not head on HIV AIDS related, but that are maybe in the transportation sector, the housing sector, um, education sector, the overall, the broader health sector that pushes this issue forward um, in a way that, that, that carries us across the finish line. And so we've heard the different report outs, um, what does that mean? Like, what 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 do we want to do as a community? I mean, we got a few minutes. Like, let's let's talk about that. You, sir. So, uh, I would like to suggest that we um, really mobilize the power of public instruction, including university level instruction, to reach the public. And um, I don't think that we've really talked that much about this. But it's the one lever we have to really start dealing with health disparities. In, and the social determinants um, in a knowledgeable way. Everything from talking about sexual education to university level education for future teachers, lawyers, healthcare providers. I just feel as though uh, a major investment has been made by this state in education, and now we need to make it work for us. Mm -hmm. so that's one of my and I think this, you might say, well, this goes without saying, but I think we should say it anyway, that Medicaid expansion is absolutely necessary and the whole body of us, you know, to, so, should say that explicitly. <coughs> so um, the North Carolina AIDS Action Network announced this morning the date of HIV Speaks on Jones Street, which is the annual HIV Treatment and Prevention Advocacy Day at the North Carolina General Assembly. That event is going to be March 12, 2019. Um, a number of you in this room have participated in that day in the past, but if, there, if you are particularly interested in being involved in sort of some of the direct advocacy work that happens at the North Carolina General Assembly on behalf of our community, um, I help run the event, so I guess I'm a little biased, but I do think it's a pretty powerful and awesome day. We will meet at the North Carolina Museum of History in the morning for a briefing then meet with staff from the governor's office, Department of Public Instruction, and state legislators throughout the day, and provide HIV and hepatitis testing at the building as well. Um, so I invite you to just save that date on your calendar, and we'll, um, registration will be live on our website in January. I think there's some real opportunities with um, HIV treatment and care um, and the switch to value-based care, which is gonna be a long and arduous route, but we have to start today. And you know, I think there's some evidence-based, easy metrics in HIV, like keeping your patients a by reading 
um, you know, number of people you you have on prep in the populations that need it the most, and you're, you're staying on prep. So <coughs> there's some easy metrics that could be um, implemented as metrics for value-based care. And so HIV could be a model for value-based care. So housing. One of the biggest problems that we have, of course, is that we don't have enough affordable, decent housing to stop. <laughs> what we do have, though, is the money to help pay rent for people who are HIV positive. What we can't find is enough housing. So partnerships with housing authorities or other housing groups could be a very powerful way for us to move forward with that. Uh, the, the Hopper Modernization Act a couple of years ago really redid the formula of housing money that's going to come down the pipe pretty soon. So the South is going to see a lot more. Uh, SAFI did a lot of work on this. Uh, but if we don't have affordable housing to find, then we can't pay for it. So we, we need more partnerships with, with good housing groups. And so I just want to add to that. One of the uh, things that we came up in our group with was that NGOs and nonprofits should become landlords. Um, you can get that rent, you can buy housing, make sure that it's safe, decent. You can get that rent, which goes to your, um, the long-term sustainability of your organization is earned income. Um, and it is a different way to think about how you interact uh, with the community. Uh, sorry, I just, I raised my hand earlier. Um, and to also piggyback off that, we know that there are a lot of people who are living with HIV who theoretically would qualify for housing and get that subsidy, but they have criminal backgrounds that prohibit them from being able to live in public housing. And so that also becomes a huge barrier that we have to think about. Can we do expungement of records? Can we do uh, or change the policy around people with criminal backgrounds living in these in certain areas and getting access to these subsidies. So if you have clients who need expungements, please reach out to the North Carolina Justice Center. They're doing um, statewide expansions. They may be doing some in a, clinic, in a community near you and can make sure that people from your community um, get the information they need. Brad? I, all right. I have three more. Mm -hmm. yeah, this brother here, this sister right here, and this brother right here. So I, I think another good step that we could take is something that is, I think currently missing is perhaps bringing us all together again and talk about what everyone is currently doing in the space because there may be benefits that are already there that we don't know that are there. For instance, I'm a pharmacist, I run a specialty pharmacy. You guys probably don't understand what we do in this space, how we can ship patients their medications, how we're over overcoming financial barriers to therapy, various things to ensure that the patients are adhering to the medication. We know that if their uh, viral load is suppressed, they're not going to be transmitting to that. You guys probably don't know that. There's probably many things that you do that I'm not aware that you're doing. And so if we can bring it together again and talk about what each of us are currently doing in this space, we may find that we already have things that we can fill those gaps without trying to have to reinvent something. That we're talking a lot about education, but perhaps it's about educating us too. So then we're already in the space. Maybe we can connect um, and we can galvanize the relationships that we have in this room to help advance them. and then collectively our voice becomes louder and we can have more impact in the communities that we serve. Just a thought. Ms. Fowler. I was just going to say, uh, Jeremy, that I think, like I said on the church, the, the uh, faith group, I'm sorry, and uh, we also talked about that as we're looking at new existing fixes down the road and joining groups where we are, you know, it starts with the individual. So all of us, as we walk out of here today, I think you would agree, you know, we're, we're empowered. And hopefully if we are more energized, you know, than ever before, because you've given us a lot to think about and be grateful for. So wherever we are, we can make it. And I know that seems really simple, but uh, there are a lot of gaps. We have a lot of work to do. Um, Zach was just, you know, I was just reiterating, you know, the secretary talked about the fact that one, let's say yes next week. And that's the other thing, too. I think we've got a pledge to get more informed and stay involved. You know, we, we need to help this administration. This is me saying this. Not we ought to help you to see it uh, and represent. Uh, can't just sit back and be inactive. But our secretary talked about, 
that, you know, with HIV, we kind of got it a long time ago. Not that we've achieved it all, Allison, but you know, we got, we got to treat that whole person. She's saying let's do that for everybody and that people living with HIV will benefit if we invest in a, in a uh, more effective and comprehensive system for every North Carolina. And that, I think, is what the governor wants to say yes about. Absolutely. This brother right here. Me? Um, I think this is off the topic of I think we didn't discuss it, but I think next time we come together, I, I think we should discuss our survivors. We have a lot of survivors, and they, they're out there, but we're not really doing nothing with them. And then they ask the question, who are the problems, and what do you need to need that? And I think across the country, a lot of other states are doing actual survivor programs for survivors. You know, we, we, we still need help, too. It's not that. Mm -hmm. We still need help. They're playing okay. some this way, so we still need the help, but no one's like reaching out to say, okay, we're going to work on some bodies here, and we're still working on prevention, prevention, prevention. We still got a large number of population, that's become the only population of survivors in this whole state. It's, it's incredible. I just think next time, it's a, a topic of thought, but think about who can we do for our survivors now that we have like, so many of them. How can we support them? Because they have they suffer all the same issues, but I mean, I also say about the holistic health care issue, I think that's a good point because that's what we're going to start to do. A new wellness clinic on campus, and that's what we're doing. We're doing a holistic health care program. We're going to screen for all your health issues. You know what I mean? You're having to help you get, make, make, uh, make, get, get better what you're doing. But I think that's a good thing to think about for the next time. Said we had three more and we were done, and I see some other people raise their hands. But I, I'm going to acknowledge the artist because he's got to come up in a moment anyway. So why don't you come this way while Brother Wright asks his question or makes his comment. Come on. Let's go. Uh, uh, it's my job to get us in and out. So, uh, so, so Brother Wright. I applaud everything. Roy Cooper, Governor, World AIDS Day 2018. By the Governor of the State of North Carolina, a proclamation. Stand with the estimated 37 million people living with HIV AIDS worldwide and renew our commitment to preventing the spread of this virus. And whereas, as of December 2017, an estimated 40,000 people in North Carolina were living with HIV AIDS, of which approximately 5,000 are unaware of their infection. And whereas approximately 1,300 new HIV cases are diagnosed per year in North Carolina, the majority in African American and Latinx communities. And whereas there is no cure for HIV, but scientists and community members are collaborating to develop a cure, effective treatment with antiretroviral anti drugs suppresses the virus so that transmission does not occur and people with HIV can enjoy healthy and productive lives. And whereas approximately 86% of all clients enrolled in North Carolina's HIV Medication Assistance Program, HMAP, are virally suppressed, and whereas North Carolina's increased promotion of HIV pre-exposure prophylaxis, PrEP, along with other proven prevention strategies can significantly reduce the risk of acquiring HIV, and whereas the state of North Carolina joins people living with HIV, all local health departments, HIV AIDS community organizations, local hospitals, HIV medical providers, researchers, and other community and faith-based allies in supporting efforts to improve education, prevention, access to care, treatment, and supportive services, and to encourage effective partnerships to end the spread of HIV AIDS. Now, therefore, I, Roy Cooper, Governor of the State of North Carolina, do hereby proclaim December 1st, 2018, as World AIDS Day in North Carolina, and commend its observance to all citizens, signed Governor Roy Cooper.